and welcome to Stingray Toms Florida and another interesting video. Today I have an extended look at the interview that's in my video about shell collecting and the Beale Maltby Shell Museum, which for 48 years called Rollins College its home. You can watch that video by clicking on the link. It'll also be in the show description. As of 1988, the Beale Maltby Shell Museum closed its doors forever and the nearly 2 million specimens in its collection were transferred to the Florida Museum of Natural History. So I recently stopped in Gainesville with my friend Katie to speak with John Slapsinski, the Invertebrate Zoology Collection Manager at the Florida Museum. The parts of the conversation that directly covered the Beale Maltby Museum and its collection are in the other video but John was nice enough to discuss a few more things to do with the massive shell collection he manages and the importance of such collections for today and in the future. There will also be a cool surprise near the end. We get to see that the collection isn't just shells of mollusks, sometimes it's much more. Okay, uh, my name is John Slepsinski. I'm Collections Manager at Florida Museum of Natural History and um, I'm interested in mollusks, so I'm especially interested in land snails. I, um, I started out being interested in land snails from a, a paper placemat in a restaurant, and um, they had seashells. This was in Ocracoke, North Carolina. It had all sorts of tropical seashells, which I went out and tried to find on the Ocracoke beach, and they weren't there, but I got hooked. And then from there, we lived uh, four hours from the coast, so I got interested in land snails when I was mowing lawns as a teenager. And it's all been downhill from there. Um, they, they weren't that common. Okay, uh, okay. I would see a dead shell or two, something like that, <laughs> and, and you know, pick it up and say, what is this? And then trying to find out um, any information about land snails in particular is really hard. The literature is really scattered. It's 50 years, 60 years old, uh, incomplete, not really up to date. Wow. And, but that got me hooked because it took so much work to try to fig figure things out that it just got to be an addiction. <laughs> I, I have friends who are herpetologists and they've almost divided the world up. So there's the person that works in Honduras. Whereas for land snails or most invertebrate groups, the planet is your oyster. Um, <laughs> it's you know, there's a, a lot that you can do, and you have a lot of flexibility, and you can just go with the flow, uh, whatever opportunities present themselves. So I do a lot of work right now in Hawaii with collaborators, uh, and we are trying to figure out what's left of the Hawaiian fauna. So the Hawaiian land snails. But mollusks in general, if you look at all extinctions in recent times, um, within since 1500 or so, the vast majority of those extinctions are mollusks, mostly land snails and uh, freshwater clam. So the two big groups are land snails and, um, and freshwater clams and snails. Those have been impacted the most of any animal group. And so the Hawaiian fauna was, uh, up until a few years ago, thought to be almost entirely wiped out, the native snails of the Hawaiian Islands. And uh, my colleagues and I have been surveying um, in the Hawaiian Islands, and we're finding a lot of little remnant populations of these supposedly extinct snails. So when you don't know something's left, there's no effort to try to conserve them. It's, it's gone, we don't, you know, nothing we could do about it. But now that we know that these things are still around, um, we, can, we can focus conservation efforts on those. And we're also finding new species. So in, in a group that was supposedly mostly extinct, we've named two, two species this year. Um, so it's, it's been really rewarding on, on that level. And then I also do a lot of uh, biodiversity surveys in remote places like Papua New Guinea and Madagascar. And, um, and we're finding many, many new species in those two areas because they've not been very well sampled. Um, uh, 
New Guinea, most of the area is not really accessible by road. You have to fly in, stay with um, uh, a village, and then go climb a mountain or someplace that you're interested in surveying, and then survey there. And it's just fantastic. It's amazing what, they're, what we still don't know. And those are the things that are easy to tell apart. You have other things that are difficult to tell apart that you need genetics for. And so when we go collecting, we tend to take a tissue sample um, and preserve the animals so that they can be studied later for anatomy. And the tissue sample can be, um, first we do something called barcoding. So we take a particular portion of DNA that is relatively rapidly evolving so that you can tell species apart pretty easily. And you can use that almost as barcode for a species. Um, and we're finding a lot of, of interesting new things out there doing that. So museum collections are really important to look at diversity. So I might have what I think is a hundred of one thing, but somebody else looks at DNA and thinks, okay, there may be two different species there. So they can come to a collection and rather than traveling all across the world to try to sample species across the planet, which would be prohibitively expensive, they can go to a museum collection where all of this is gathered together in one spot and they can look at the diversity within a species and between species um, in a way that you couldn't do if there weren't museum collections. Uh, so each of these each of these individual records, this is one species of beach clam, and it'll have information about where it was found and uh, when it was found. And so we can look at the distributions of things. In fact, recently, people looked at two species, two um, forms of a particular type of moon snail that's common here in Florida. And what they realized is it's actually two different species. And you go back to those museum collections and you say, oh, yeah, this one is clearly this one, this species because of this characteristic on it. And this one is not. And in that way, we now know that of these two moon snails, one of them is primarily found in the Gulf and the other one is primarily found along the eastern coastal plain. And um, you know, all that would be much more difficult if you didn't have museum collections. So each of these has a location uh, written on it. But if I were to try to map this out, it would take me a long time to figure out where Long Key is, put a dot on Long Key, uh, maybe try to figure out how large an error around that dot that I'm comfortable with, um, because long key is fairly big. Um, and then this one, Minnesota key, it would take me a long time to add those uh, bits of information to make a map. So what we're doing throughout uh, our collection is going through and finding latitudes and longitudes for all of these uh, specimens. This will make it so much easier for researchers around the world to plot out maps of our specimens, um, which would otherwise be too time intensive to, to do. So, um, so we have a number of students working for us uh, on several grants, um, basically looking up localities, finding out the latitude and longitude. Yeah. Everybody wants to work with vertebrates. <laughs> No. But that's, I think that's, I'm not very competitive, so for me, I would rather be in a field where I have more space and more freedom and less of the more aggressive competition that you find in some places. Yeah. John also showed us parts of the collection in the stacks, which were mostly shell specimens, of course, but he also shared the story of one of the more interesting complete mollusks in the collection, an intact rhomboid or diamond squid.
Enjoy. Florida is a really nice place to to look at mollusks. We get a lot of uh, really interesting things that wash ashore up on the beaches, and that happens especially in the summertime. Uh, Florida has that really well-known thunderstormy, um, hot summers, and those uh, all that heat cre creates a lot of uplift, which draws air in from each coast and causes an upwelling event in the summertime, so that deeper water animals are brought into shallower waters and then can be washed ashore. And so we get some really cool, really cool animals like these rhomboid squids. I also have a giant squid, but that one is in a different location. Oh, wow. But this beautiful rhomboid squid is fairly common, but there are very few museum specimens available. And that's because squids tend to be fairly difficult to, um, to collect. You basically have to drag a net behind a boat, and often that causes a great deal of damage with the specimens. You see the beak right in here, and that tears off pieces of... Uh, fish or whatever it's eating and it's got these long tentacles to catch fish whoops but um this washed ashore in new smyrna beach in i need to brief print that label in the <laughs> in uh, 2005 and um the beach cleanup crew uh, sent me a quick message that they had something they thought was cool and I grabbed a pickup truck and a bucket of ice and went down and got it. Classified as Thysanotuthis rhombus, the rhomboid or diamond-shaped squid is a large species of squid which is found throughout tropical and subtropical waters around the world. Both its Latin and English common names refer to the shape of the fins that run the length of the mantle or body. Specimens can reach a mantle length of over 3 feet or a meter and weigh up to 66 pounds or 30 kilograms. And they can reach that size all within the space of about a year, the rhomboid's lifespan. It's one of the more interesting mollusks in our oceans. It just happens to be one without an external shell. But if you've ever prepped squid for dinner, you know they have a small gladius, or rod. That's how the shell developed in them. And finally, here's one more clip where John tells a quick story of one of his adventures in collecting specimens. Enjoy! It's not really funny. Uh, we were climbing a mountain in, in New Guinea, and we had a... a large group of people that were, were helping us, um, uh, local, local folks from the village that we had been camping at the week before. And um, I was with a herpetologist and we were trying to um, find a frog that was calling at night. And so basically everybody kind of closes their eyes and listens and you know, each person says this, this, this and then you triangulate to where you think that frog is going to be. And one of, one of the people that was with us had their headlamp still on, and my colleague was worried that it was going to frighten the frog and get it to stop calling. And so he went like this, like, turn off your light. And he thought he was being hexed. And he ran, threw off his headlamp, and ran down the mountain in the dark for you know five miles and and in that situation you have to be very careful because you're staying with other people on their property and this is can be very serious and so we had the whole village came up the next day and we had to explain what the problem was and we allied everybody's fears but it was a little bit scary at, at times because you don't want to be I mean that's a really bad thing to be thought of as hexing somebody so I think that's probably the strangest thing so the question is did you find the frog <laughs> I don't remember if we ever found that frog <laughs> I don't know 
<laughs> I, I think we probably did. We we usually found the frog. <laughs> but it didn't stop you. The guy running five miles away from you in the middle of the night. But we didn't, didn't realize from... he just disappeared. Yeah, yeah, and we was... didn't know what happened till the next day. <laughs> so That wraps up this video. Remember, there is more of this interview in the main video on shell collecting and the Beale Maltby Shell Museum. The link is in the description. As I said in the main video, I really appreciate the assistance of John and the Florida Museum of Natural History with this story. I also want to say thanks to my friend Katie for helping out with stuff for the video. Check out her blog and Instagram if you like great photography. Links in the description. Thank you again for watching another of Stingray Tom's videos. I appreciate it. If you enjoyed it, please share it and hit the like button and subscribe. All of that is free to do and helps me out a lot. Stingray Tom's Florida, traveling through time around the Sunshine State.